An outline of what this lecture will consist of. We'll first talk about two examples of simple experiments. We will then talk about experimental variables. This will mainly just be a section of terms. We will then start talking about why experiments are able to support causal claims. Then we will go into the two types of experimental designs, independent groups and within groups designs. Finally, we will examine causal claims and validity in relation to experiments. So starting with our first example, here the question researchers asked is what type of note taking is best? So they hypothesized that there would be some difference between taking notes with pen and pencil and with computers. Please note that this is the difference between just a general question and a hypothesis. A hypothesis generally is looking at some specific difference or relationship. Also, in this case, the hypothesis is non-directional as it is just looking for some difference between these two note-taking styles. There were 67 college students in this experiment and the method consisted of the students watching five TED Talks and being randomly assigned to take notes on these TED Talks via either pen and paper or with a computer. And it is important to remember that students were randomly assigned to these groups. After they had watched and taken notes, they then spent 30 minutes performing some unrelated task, after which they were given a series of essay questions to test how well they had been able to learn the material. These essay questions were divided into two different sections. One set were conceptual questions, asking them to make some kind of further generalization based on the information they had learned. And the other half were factional questions in which they were simply asked to relate facts that they had learned throughout the presentations. Here's what they found. Um, let me just turn on this pointer. So the lighter colored or these pink colored ones are those who took notes on laptops. The ones in blue are those who took notes via longhand. This sort of is a, a baseline, you could say. And here they're looking at how the factual responses were given and you see that there's almost no difference in note-taking styles on how well people are able to retain factual information. We do however see a difference when it comes to conceptual questions where those who took notes via pen and pencil performed better than those who performed or took notes via computer. Okay finally just a little question to ask yourself so why is this an experiment and not just some type of association between note taking and performance the main primary reason here would be that students were randomly assigned to these groups you manipulated what type of note taking they did and therefore you're able to infer that it is your manipulation that led to these differences the second experiment had to do with how large serving plates were and how much this is likely to influence our eating habits. So the question here was, does serving food on a larger plate make people eat more? This is converted to a hypothesis and there is some difference between eating behaviors based on the size of serving plates. There were 68 college students in this experiment. Um, the method involved having large or small serving bowls full of pasta. They were not of course shown at the same time. Students were randomly assigned by a coin flip to either be in the large bowl or the small bowl condition. And what they did is they allowed the students to select as much food as they wanted from these bowls, after which they measured the plates to see how much they had taken. Then they let them eat as much as they wanted. And then they measured the food once more to see what the difference in weight was to measure how much food the students had eaten. It is important to note that they also, every time the bowls would be less than half full, would refill the bowls so as to never have the bowls be too empty and give the illusion of there not being enough because they didn't want them or this low amount of food in a bowl to impact people's choices as to how much food they took from the bowl. As you'll find out later, that is called a control variable. So here's what happened. When food was presented or given to them in a medium sized bowl, they actually took less pasta, 200 grams here is what they took. This is, I guess it's 454 grams to a pound, so a little bit less than half a pound of pasta. And those who took food from the large bowl, they ate all the way up here around 350 grams, which we would say is almost three quarters of a pound of pasta. This is just a similar graph represented in calories consumed, where you see those who took food from the medium bowl 
ate less calories than those who ate from the large bowl. Now a similar question to the previous one. Why is this an experiment and not simply an association between eating and bowl size? And again, the primary reason is because we are randomly placing students into different types of groups and then seeing what is happening after we have randomly manipulated these participants. Okay, some terms. An experiment is a research context in which a researcher has manipulated at least one variable and measured a second variable. This is similar to in the note-taking study where the researchers assigned students to either take notes via pen and paper or with a computer. A manipulated variable is the variable that the researcher controls. This would be note-taking style when it came to that experiment. It is whatever variable the researcher has identified multiple levels of, we'll talk about that in a second, and they now are able to define what participant goes into which group. A measured variable is simply a variable that can be measured or recorded, and these are oftentimes, they can consist of self-reports, behavioral outcomes, or physiological measurements. This is analogous with what we've talked about in previous chapters. The independent variable is often synonymous with the manipulated variable, and this is just the primary variable or variables that the experimenter is manipulating. The dependent variable, also sometimes called an outcome variable, is the variable that one is interested in measuring so as to see the effect that the manipulation had on participants. Levels are what we commonly use, commonly use to define the various conditions of an independent variable. So the independent variable of serving size had two levels, one large bowl and one small bowl. Each of those is a level of the independent variable. Control variables are variables that are held constant by the experimenter to control for their possible effect on the dependent variable. So when I said that they continued to fill up the bowls of pasta so as to never have them appear to be too empty, and that emptiness might result in people not taking as much food because of social norms, by always filling up the bowls again and maintaining that they always remained at least halfway full, they reduced the impact of how full the bowl was on people's eating behaviors. This would be an example of a control variable. Oftentimes, experiments maintain many such control variables, whether actively or just by nature of the experimental design, to keep other factors from influencing their results. Wait, some more terms from the next section. So, experiments are able to establish covariance, and here are some terms you'll need to know as we talk about this. So one, comparison groups. These are groups to compare the results we're interested in. Oftentimes you could consider all of the levels of an independent variable serving as comparison groups to each other. A treatment group is a group that receives some type of experimental manipulation. Um, there can also be multiple treatment groups in a single experiment. So for example, in the serving size, both of those could technically be considered treatment groups because one manipulated in both situations what happened. This is contrasted oftentimes with a control group, and these are groups that do not receive any kind of experimental manipulation, and these often serve as a baseline comparison group, as you have done nothing to them, and ostensibly their performance will match that of their everyday daily performance. A placebo group is a type of control group that receives a placebo. A placebo is simply just a sham treatment that has all the appearances of being a true treatment without any of the active ingredients. A design confound is an alternative explanation for the results at hand. So for example, if in the pasta study they had not controlled for how much food was in the bowl and they found that in the smaller bowl they ate less, and it had also been the bowl that finished more quickly, it could be that people not wanting to take the last of the pasta is actually what influenced their eating behaviors instead of the size of the bowl. In that case, how full that bowl was would have been a confound. Systematic variability refers to variability that changes along with the independent variable, but is something else. Some other variable is changing systematically with the independent variable, 
and this variable is actually in truth what might be causing our differences that we observe on the dependent variable. Ultimately, it is very difficult to know when systematic variability is there, to know whether it is that new extraneous variable or your actual manipulated variable because they're both changing together and therefore it becomes very difficult to know which one is the true cause. Selection effects refer to the idea that groups are not created in equal ways. This could be if people are not using some type of random sampling and their own biases are beginning to influence who they assign to what type of group. This is also especially problematic when participants or subjects are allowed to choose the groups that they would like to be in. Their own preferences ultimately might result in them choosing one group over another, and those types of preferences ultimately might underlie other group dynamics, and it could be then those group dynamics that are leading to these differences. Finally, there are matched groups. This is when it is very important to make sure your two different groups are as similar as possible. And so your groups are measured on whatever variables you're hoping to control. And then after getting measurement on these variables, you assign groups based on those measurements, such that if let's say height was very important for some type of experiment, you would measure everybody's height and then you would take the two tallest people and randomly assign them to one of two groups and then you would take the next two tallest people and you would again split them up into those two groups and so on and so forth until you got to the two shortest people who you again would just randomly assign to one of those two groups. That way you ensure that you have two random groups but each of them have the same amount roughly speaking of tall people and short people. Before we jump into covariance and experiments, let's just have a quick refresh on establishing causality. In order to establish causality, one must meet three criteria. One must first establish covariance between the various variables of interest. Then one must establish temporal precedence, meaning that your manipulated variable or your causal variable comes before your dependent variable or your outcome variable. And one must establish high internal validity meaning one rules out as many possible alternative explanations as possible. And we will now talk about how experiments actually satisfy all three of these criteria. When it comes to establishing covariance, remember that covariance is often demonstrated using correlations or regressions to show a relationship between two or more variables, but group differences can also be a sign of covariance. Example here is just the large bowl calories were different than small bowl calories, meaning that there is some type of relationship or covariance between the number of calories that are eaten or consumed and the size of the bowl in which they are served. This is why it is very important to have comparison groups. If you only have one group in your experiment, there's no way to establish covariance because you only have one group that will give you one result, but there is no way to know if that result is high, low, the same as it was before, if it changed, if it remained the same. You just cannot know because all of those questions require having some other group in which to compare your main treatment group to. Most experiments, well, all experiments have at a minimum of two groups and therefore they are largely able to establish covariance. Also, a comparison group does not have to be a control group. Sometimes we'll just simply have multiple levels of a manipulation and compare them to each other. So here we could say I'm interested in the effects of certain types of caffeine on reaction times and I give half my participants coffee to drink and the other half tea to drink and I look at their performance on a reaction time task. In this case, both groups are ultimately some form of manipulation. If I wanted a control group here, I could potentially have a group of people who drank nothing or maybe drank water that had no caffeine in it. When it comes to establishing temporal precedence, in an experimental context, by manipulating the level that a participant is placed in, so what level of the independent variable they are put in, the experimenter pretty much guarantees that the causal variable comes before the outcome variable. It is what we then want to make the claim. The independent variable is what led to differences on the dependent variable. And by placing people into different conditions or levels of the independent variable, we are ultimately ensuring that that variable came prior to the dependent variable. We don't have experiments in which we measure people on our metric of interest and then put them into the groups of the independent variable. That just wouldn't make sense. 
An example is the changing the type of notes that students took, and then they, that changed how they performed on a subsequent exam. It would be impossible for their performance on some test to influence what type of notes they took. It is only, it could be that they took notes first, which then led to differences on their performance. When it comes to establishing internal validity, there are much more concerns here when it comes to experiments than the previous forms we have talked about previously. There are several ways in which it can be established. The first is managing confounds. So the most common of use or manner for dealing with confounds is to have control variables. So if a variable is identified to have some possible relationship to our dependent variable, but is not the primary independent variable of interest, what we can do is manage this by making sure that whatever level of this miscellaneous variable exists, that we make sure that that same level exists across all of the groups in our experiment. So an example is in the pasta study. Imagine if there was tastier pasta in the larger bowl. This would ultimately be a confound because people might now be choosing to eat more from the larger bowl, not because it was larger, but because there's tastier pasta in that larger bowl. This could be mitigated by making sure the same type of pasta is used in both bowls. It would now become a control variable. And we know that while the type of pasta may influence our eating behaviors, by making sure that both groups had the same type of pasta, we rule out the effect of type of pasta on how much they ate in the experiment. Next, we have managing systematic variability. So systematic variability is when I have some second variable that is changing its sort of condition or levels in lockstep with the independent variable and having them have such a sort of synchronous relationship makes it very difficult to know which of those two variables is ultimately driving the effect I'm seeing in the difference of my dependent variable. The most common way of dealing with this is ultimately through the use of random assignment. So Imagine again in that pasta study that there were some people who were more hungry in the large bowl condition than they were in the small bowl condition. If I had more hungry people in the large bowl condition, that could potentially explain why they ate more. In this case, I have the variable hunger that is systematically varying with the independent variable of bowl size. Notice this doesn't happen or it doesn't have to happen on purpose. It can occasionally happen just by chance but more often is by some other type of unknown variable that we're either not paying attention to or we'll actually talk about selection effects in a moment. One of the best ways to deal with this is ultimately through random assignment. Through randomly assigning participants and conditions, one can ultimately assume that even though there might be differences of other variables surrounding our participants and the experiment itself, that on average those differences will wash out. Finally, there are selection effects. And selection effects, as we said before, just refer to different types of people being able to either self-select into groups of a study or the participant having some bias in how they are ascribing them to groups in a study. And again, the most common way of dealing with this is also through the use of random selection. So allowing a participant to self-select into a study would be problematic because it could be underlying personality characteristics that are leading them into their different groups and that could be what is causing the difference. And ultimately, again, like I said, one of the best ways to deal with this is through random selection. That way you minimize what types of groups could be involved in each of those types of groups. Okay. Uh, a little bit more about selection effects and systematic variability effects. So some contexts call for all of the differences between a group in a, groups in an experiment to be minimized. So in such contexts, we tend to use what are known as matched group designs. So previously I gave the example that height could be something we were trying to control for. And so we measured everybody's height. We took the two tallest people. We put them both into the two groups that we care about. We took the next two and we split them up into the next two groups, same as the two tallest people. We took the next two tallest people and again, split them up in the same way. And ultimately what we have is a set of two groups in which there are tall people who are roughly equivalent in height and their medium height people who are also roughly equivalent in height and short people are the same. This is how ultimately we can be very rigorous about controlling for external variables that we don't particularly care about, but might have an impact on our experimental design. 
Another way of dealing with this is within subjects designs or within groups designs, but we'll talk about that later. By matching groups, a researcher can ensure that the variable the groups are matched on is not driving the effect. And this is because both of those groups are now ultimately matched on that variable. And so when tested on that variable, it should have very close to the same results. So an example here is that if I believe athletic habits will impact eating behavior and I want to rule out this effect, I can ask everyone about their athletic habits and then divide them into two groups where the two highest are in different groups and the two lowest are also in different groups. And of course, everybody in between. That way, if I was to measure the average athletic abilities or habits of both groups, they would be roughly identical. Moving on into independent groups designs, so some terms for this section. Independent groups designs are a type of experimental context in which participants are only ever exposed to one level of a specific independent variable. A post-test only design, this is where participants are randomly assigned to one and only one level of the independent variable, and then they're measured on some dependent variable. Note that there could be many dependent variables, but in the simplest form, there is one independent variable with two levels and one dependent variable. There are also pretest, post-test designs, and this is where, again, participants are randomly assigned to receive only one level of the independent variable, but they're measured twice on the dependent variable. We'll have a diagram in just a moment to talk about that. So here's just a little bit about the differences between post-test only and pre-test, post-test designs. Post-test only designs are designs in which you have an independent variable. In this case, there are two different groups. Here you have the two different levels. So this could be note-taking via computer and note-taking via pen and paper. You randomly assign people into both of these groups. So they have no choice and no way of knowing which group they will be in followed by some measurement on the dependent variable. This would be how well they performed on answering their questions. So these types of designs do satisfy all three criteria for causation, so long as the experiment is designed well and high internal validity is maintained. Pre-test post designs also satisfy all three criteria for causation, but they have a slightly different structure. Here, what I would do is randomly assign people to their two different conditions, but I would now measure them on some dependent variable first, then I would give them the manipulation of some kind, followed by measuring them on that same variable again. So here you can see I'm randomly assigning people to receive either a mindfulness class or a nutrition class, and I would like to see the impact this has on people's verbal GRE scores. But what I do now is I get a baseline of people's GRE scores, followed by giving them the interventions and then measure them again. So here really in effect what I'm doing is I'm looking at the change over the independent variable as opposed to just looking at the difference across two groups. Also, please remember it is not about which one is better. Some contexts fit one design over another. For example, it is easy with experimental exams, so to speak, like you saw with the previous GRE questionnaire. I could test you on some questions, give you an intervention, test you on some more questions. I probably could not have done that with the pasta, where I allowed you to eat your fill of pasta to establish a baseline. Then I gave you a new larger bowl to take food from and measure how much you were going to eat after this manipulation, as you would already be full from the previous eating of pasta. Some terms to talk about for within groups designs. Within groups designs are designs in which all participants are exposed to each and all levels of the independent variable. Power is a statistical term. It refers to the probability of correctly retaining the null hypothesis given that there was no true effect in the population. Order effects refer to the impact of participating in one level of an independent variable has on the participation in subsequent levels of the independent variable. Finally, demand characteristics are cues given off by the experimenter or even the experimental context itself that could potentially influence how participants respond. So the two primary types of within groups designs a repeated measures design. This is overwhelmingly the most common. 
So here you only have one group and they first are given some type of manipulation. They then rate or answer on the dependent variable. Then they're given the second manipulation upon which they then make again some type of response on the dependent variable. What you're seeing here, <coughs> excuse me, researchers wanted to know whether eating chocolate by yourself versus eating chocolate with someone else would change how you rated your sort of subjective liking of that chocolate. And so what they did is here you ate a piece of chocolate with a partner or a confederate, you rated how good that chocolate was, then you ate the chocolate by yourself, and then you rated how good that chocolate was. Now, in order to make this believable, the participants told part or the experimenters told participants that these two chocolates were different. In fact, they were the same. Here you can see that when they ate the chocolate together, they rated the chocolate as more tasty, I suppose, than when they ate that chocolate by themselves. Another type of within groups designs are called concurrent measures designs. These are actually used on infants quite a bit. And this is where you show both levels of the independent variable simultaneously to the participant. So an example here would be to look at whether infants prefer to gaze at men or women. And what you do is on a computer screen in front of the infant, you give a female and a male face and you look at which one they tend to fixate on for a longer period of time. Here, both levels, female and male faces, are presented simultaneously. Some advantages of within groups designs. They ensure that your two or more groups will be equivalent because all of your groups are ultimately made up of the same people just receiving different manipulations. Also, such designs have higher power than between groups designs. This is, while well, you don't have to know exactly why, largely due to the fact that you are able to remove much of the miscellaneous variance in performance across both of your participant groups, because again, they are the same people. A way to visualize this would be is if I was looking at differences in how people's reaction times affected, or how caffeine affected their reaction times, I could measure this, but I would have some people who are just naturally faster than others. And by having the same set of people in both groups, I am able to rule out individual differences in their reaction times because a fast person in one group will still be a fast person in the other group. Finally, such designs require a smaller sample size to reliably find an effect compared to finding the same sized effect in between groups designs. And this is again, ultimately because of how the structure of a within groups design is carried out. If I had two groups of 20 people and I was comparing them on some metric with a within groups design, I only need 20 people because I just expose them to both and measure them twice. Finally, it is important to note that match group designs, while not technically speaking within groups designs, can be treated and analyzed in the same fashion as a within groups design. And this is ultimately because, think in this within groups design context, you have the same people who are in both groups. So fast people are the same kind of fast people in both groups. Slow people are the same type of slow people in both groups. Thinking back to what we do in match designs, we take our fastest people and split them among the groups. We take our slowest people and split them among the groups, which is ultimately very similar to a within groups design. Hence, we analyze it in the same way. One of the primary disadvantages of within groups designs are order effects. So order effects can cause problems for internal validity because the difference between groups can no longer be attributed to the independent variable itself and might be attributed to the order in which participants were exposed to the independent variable itself. One of the forms of this is called practice effects or conversely fatigue effects. And these are order effects in which participants either gain experience and thus perform better on subsequent levels of the independent variable, or they might get tired taking part in the first levels of the independent variable, and this fatigue might ultimately cause them to have a different performance later on. One common way of seeing this is most of us have taken surveys that are hundreds of questions long, and we do take great care to answer sort of conscientiously in the beginning, but after a couple hundred agree-disagree responses, we tend to not care so much. 
This is ultimately a type of fatigue effect. Another type of order effect are called carryover effects, and this is where you have some contamination from one level of your independent variable to another. For example, if it had to do with mood inductions, perhaps in the first level of the independent variable, I show you some very sad films that causes you to have a more negative mood. And then in the subsequent level, I give you a neutral video to have sort of ostensibly a neutral mood. There is very difficult way, or it's difficult to know whether one is still feeling negative after the first mood induction, and it could be that residual negativity that is now changing our performance on these subsequent levels. This is often addressed with something called counterbalancing. Fully counterbalancing just refers to making sure that every possible order of your levels is presented in the experiment. So if I go back to this analogy of where, or example where I used a negative mood induction along with a neutral mood induction, what I would do is for half the participants, I would give them the negative mood induction before the neutral mood induction. And for the other half, I would give them the neutral mood induction before the negative mood induction. From that, I could either examine how they performed differently, which could lead to new experimental questions, or now when I make an aggregate of these scores, I can ultimately assume that that effect washes out because I will average it out in the math itself. Partial counterbalancing is talked about oftentimes and is one of the most practical actual implementations of this that you'll see in large scale experiments. But when we have many levels of an independent variable, it becomes very difficult to actually fully randomize all of the various different orders. Because as soon as I have more than four or five different levels of an independent variable, it very quickly goes up to hundreds and hundreds of different combinations. And you would need thousands and thousands of participants to have enough in each group to do any kind of statistical comparisons. Instead of then having such large scale studies with so many participants, what oftentimes happens in these places is one just randomizes the order that the independent variable levels are presented to each participant. And so here, while it is the case that not every order is presented or that all orders are presented equally, because they are randomized, you imagine that the effects of the order levels will ultimately wash out again when you take averages. Finally, a form that you're likely to hear when it comes to counterbalancing is something called a Latin square. And ultimately what this is, is a form of taking the order of your experiment. Let's say I have six levels of my independent variable and I make sure that each level occupies the first position at least once. And then I continue to count down sequentially from there. So for example, the first set might just be one, two, three, four, five, six. The second one, I could start it with a two, in which case I would have two, three, four, five, six, followed by one, and so on and so forth. So if another example could be, I have the fifth level as the first place, and so now I would have the order five, six, and then one, two, three, four. And in this way, ultimately, I'm ensuring that the order remains consistent, but each one occupies that first position. Some other disadvantages of within groups designs. So we already talked about order effects. It is sometimes not possible or is just impractical to implement such a design. So in that pasta study, for example, participants would likely still be full from the previous condition if you tried to use a within groups design here. Finally, demand characteristics. So like I said previously, demand characteristics refer to clues that the participants might glean as to either the purpose of the study or how they are supposed to respond, which could then ultimately change their performance on the dependent variables. When it comes to within groups designs, this is even more likely because participants are exposed to all of the levels of the independent variable, and they might look at the differences across these different levels and get clues on what the true purpose of the experiment is and based on that change their behavior. A note about pretest post-test designs versus repeated measures. They are very similar, but they're not in fact the same thing. So notice that for the pretest post-test design, we are measuring the dependent variable twice, which is very similar to the repeated measures design, except 
In the pretest post-test design, we randomly assign participants to receive only one level of the independent variable and another set to receive the other. Whereas in a repeated measures design, you see that a participant is exposed to one level of the independent variable measured on a dependent variable. They're exposed to the other level of the independent variable and then measured again. This random assignment that you see is not changing what level of the independent variable they're being exposed to, but it is rather a counterbalancing situation in which half of the participants see level A before level B and the other half see level B before level A. Okay, now I'll start talking about experiments and validity. So the first one is construct validity, and this just refers to how well our measures either measured or manipulated. Uh, in experiments, we have the additional benefit of manipulation checks, and these are additional dependent variables that researchers can add or insert into an experiment to show them that their experimental manipulation actually worked. And most often these are used when you're trying to either make participants think in certain ways or feel in certain ways. Very similar to the mood induction I talked about earlier, and that actually is the example here. So if an experiment seeks to examine the impact of mood, say good versus neutral, on performance, an additional mood questionnaire might be added to the experiment itself to ensure that the manipulation of changing people's mood actually worked. The assumption here would be that if the manipulation worked, those who are in the good manipulation group would have higher scores on the mood questionnaire than those in the neutral mood condition. Uh, another benefit here are pilot studies, and these are small scale variants of the full experiment itself carried out on different sets of participants, and they often serve either as a proof of concept that your effect is something you are likely to find, or that your manipulations actually work. So for example, instead of doing the complete experiment with the mood induction, I could simply use the mood induction itself and give them a questionnaire to see if that induction actually causes the change in mood that I'm hoping to see. When it comes to experiments and external validity, the two primary things we're concerned about in experiments is how well do the results from our experiment generalize to other people. This is oftentimes not a problem of the experiment itself, but rather how participants were sampled to take part in the study, so long as people are relatively randomly selected from the population of interest, we can assume a relatively high external validity when it comes to generalizing to other people. We do, of course, have to consider generalizing to other situations as well, and this refers to the determination of whether the situations or levels of the independent variable in this case used in our experiment accurately reflect real life situations. So an example of this is when we talked about the notes taking study at the beginning of this lecture, we used or the experimenters used TED Talks in order to provide the sort of simulated lectures, but it is unclear whether note taking from TED Talks will transfer over to note takings in an actual lecture or seminar based study or classroom. It is also important to note here that internal validity is often highly prioritized in experimental contexts and internal validity is negatively related to external validity which should make sense the more we control all of the various variables the less likely we can generalize to other contexts it is oftentimes then or at least the external validity relating to generalizing to other situations is oftentimes done by having multiple different experiments across excuse me, multiple different labs and institutions, and then pooling all of this research together to see if similar results are found across multiple different domains. When it comes to experiments and statistical validity, one can go through a series of questions about whether the data itself was examined via exploratory data analysis before any inferential statistics were conducted. Uh, another way of talking about this would be were various assumptions before conducting statistical tests controlled for, were the differences found statistically significant, and also how large were the effects. Now, speaking of effects, Effect size refers to a metric that indicates how far means are in terms of standard deviations. So it is a metric that accounts not only for the distance between two means, but the variability of two groups as well. The most common forms of an effect size you are likely to see are Cohen's D or R, which is just a correlation coefficient. 
you would also sometimes see r squared, which is talked about as the shared variance between two variables. And this is just the square of the correlation coefficient between those two variables. Also, it is important to note that just because a difference of two means is statistically significant does not mean that it will have a large effect size. A way to visualize this and some criteria. So on top, you see a list of Cohen's generalized guidelines for effect size. So in terms of the D effect size unit, a D effect of 0.2 is generally considered to be small or weak. A D effect size of 0.5 is considered to be medium or moderate and an effect size of 0.8 is oftentimes considered to be large. In terms of R or correlation coefficients, an R of 0.1 is considered to be small, an R of 0.3 is considered to be medium or moderate, and a correlation coefficient of 0.5 or greater is considered to be large or strong. Just a fun random fact, it is actually possible to interconvert between these two metrics as ultimately they're expressing something very similar. Here is just an example of how effect size gives additional information beyond just mean differences. So here you can see that the mean difference is the same across both of these groups, 9 to 11 and 9 to 11 again, but how these groups are spread out or their variabilities are in fact different. Here the variability is much smaller, while here the variability is much larger. And you can see that when there is a small variability with this mean difference, our effect size is larger than when we have the same mean difference with larger variability. Another way of thinking about this would be how much of these two groups tend to overlap with each other. Finally, experiments and internal validity. So this is oftentimes the most prioritized of the validities when it comes to experiments. And some questions about internal validity refer or center around design confounds. Were there any types of confounds that could alternatively explain the differences we found? If they are easily accessible design confounds, there is not going to be very high internal validity. When it comes to independent groups designs, were selection effects controlled for? How were participants assigned to the different groups and levels of the independent variable? When it comes to within groups designs, were order effects controlled for in some form or another? Basically, was counterbalancing used in some form, either full or random counterbalancing or some type of Latin square? Uh, 